Well, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Alex Bovey, and I'm head of research at the Courtauld Institute, and I'm really delighted to be welcoming you all to this uh, material witness session. I'm going to say a little bit about material witness and then introduce uh, you to Professor Jenny Batchelor, who is running today's session. Um, material witness has been uh, running since 2013, uh, when Chase was just a twinkle in the eye of the, um, the various uh, deans and schemers who pulled it together. And um, it, I started it when I was at the University of Kent uh, uh, and a colleague of Jenny's. I was in the School of History for a long time and Jenny was in our, um, our companion uh, department, the, second, the other large school in, in our faculty, the School of English. And, um, and although we weren't able to work very closely together, we both had and have a, a kind of deep and shared interest in the relationship between art and literature and materiality. And, um, and so uh, Material Witness, I think many of you have participated in face-to-face -face workshops. Often we go places and look at things and make things and watch other people making them and try to understand physical objects um, in, uh, in kind of analog ways. But since um, the lockdown, we have uh, inevitably had to translate ourselves into pixel form. And, um, and it's been going pretty well. I think we had a, a uh, I gave a, a workshop about drawing weeds, which I swear is more interesting than it sounds, um, uh, earlier this term. And, and that I'll do another one towards the end of the term. And uh, I'm really delighted that Jenny has agreed to do this session today. Um, Jenny is uh, ostensibly uh, a specialist in 18th century English literature, but is actually so much more than that. Her work engages with um, a literary ephemera, ephemera of all kinds. She had a huge um, a grant uh, from, I think the Leverhulme, was it, Jenny? Yeah, to, uh, yeah. to pursue a, a major study of the Lady Magazine, which is still running. Perhaps some of you have got your Norland nannies from the Lady Magazine. Um, but uh, but it, it has tied um, that uh, kind of uh, ephemeral publication in its material and now immaterial forms, digital forms, to all kinds of um, important themes within the 18th century. And in addition to that, as if, as if that wasn't enough, she she has also um, connected that very scholarly research to a much wider public through um, um, this beautiful recent publication, Jane Austen's uh, Austen Embroidery, which is um, a, a very scholarly and uh, but also practical. Um, I hate that distinction between the scholarly and the practical, um, but guide for um, that that uh, that walks the reader of Jane Austen and the lover of embroidery through uh, different uh, materials and techniques to make their own um, embroidered patterns. And it's a really, I think, inspiring example of how um, coalface scholarship can yield really interesting and I suppose unexpected outcomes for um, a much wider reading public. So um, I'm going to now hand over to Jenny uh, and uh, hope I didn't, you can correct anything that I said that was wrong or <laughs> over egg, but um, it's great to see so many of you here and, uh, and uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, the coming hour or so. So Jenny. Thanks so much, Alex, that was really lovely. And um, I don't think you said anything that was wrong except that um, the the Lady magazine is not actually related to the Ladies magazine, which is the one I'm going to be talking about in, in, a, in a direct sense. There are some sort of echoes of um, the earlier publication in that later publication, but they're, but they're not actually related. But there are many magazines over the centuries that are called the Lady or the Ladies with an IES or a Y apostrophe S. Um, and I'm going to be talking about a very particular one, but a very important one, or at least I think it's very important. Now I'm going to just share my screen with you. So let me just do that before I do anything else. I'm hoping that's all visible and you can see it okay. Yeah, okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, um, Alex, to Teresa as well, and Grace for inviting me to join you today. It's a real pleasure to be here and to be talking about things that I really enjoy rather than doing number bonds to 10 with my young son, for instance, which is how I spend a lot of my days these days. Um, and I really appreciate you coming. I live in Surrey. It's a very sunny day right here. There are other things you could be doing right now. And the fact you're not is, 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 um, is rather delightful. Um, so I, I 
I want to do today is talk to you a little bit about the kind of research journey that I've been on sporadically over quite a long period of time. Um, in fact, since I did my own PhD. Um, and to think about some of the, as Alex says, completely unexpected ways that my research on 18th century women's writing in particular, women's history and material culture um, have sort of taken me in the past few years. Material witness, as, as Alex said, is, is something that I, I, I also have a longer term connection with, or not, not as closely as Alex. So back in 2015, when Material Witness had only been running for a couple of years, um, I, would, I participated in a terrific workshop in the Special Collections at the University of Kent with colleagues from Canterbury Cathedral Library and uh, elsewhere across the consortium, where we were thinking about working with 18th and 19th century periodicals in both digital and print formats. And while my focus today is very different, um, I was struck in preparing this just how, um, how related the things I'm going to be talking about today are to the kind of research questions that were perplexing me and to be honest still perplex me a little bit today. I'm still also harping on about the ladies magazine which is what I was talking about um, back in that forum which is an early women's periodical that I suspect most of you uh, won't be familiar with, but I can um, address that here today. And it's a magazine that I'm probably going to be harping on about for some time to come, I think. My interest in the magazine is at the root of the research, um, there we go, uh, behind uh, the root of the research that led to the creation of this book, Jane Austen Embroidery that Alex introduced, which is a, a popular, crossover history come craft book that I recently published with Alison Larkin. It's come out in the UK with Pavilion and um, recently with Dover in the US. And my interest in the latest magazine, as I say, is a very long standing. It dates back to my PhD, which I completed back in, what was it, 2002? And I think it was in 2000 that I first became alert to this incredible publication. Now, my dissertation was on uh, dress, needlework and the female body in 18th century literature and culture and it has one chapter in it and in the book that eventually emerged from it which is about how dress is thought about and represented in serial publications of different kinds so you know essay periodicals like the Tatler and Spectator, in pocket books which are sort of weird hybrid diary come account books that had fashion illustrations in them and in early women's magazines as well, which is how the ladies magazine factored into that work that I was doing. Because the ladies magazine was the most long running, influential and probably the most recognisably modern mag uh, women's magazine of the period. It was a monthly publication and like most periodicals um, of, of the day, it had an annual supplement issue each year. So it had 13 issues a year, which if you well, if you know anything about modern day magazines, they often run to 13 issues a year too. It's a, it's a legacy from this period. So it published 13 issues a year and the ladies magazine ran for uh, 62 years. So it ran from 1770 to 1832, although it has various afterlives, um, which I'm not going to talk about here today. The, the fact I just want to underline really though, is that the, the survival, the longevity of the ladies magazine is remarkable. Um, it's remarkable because the, the periodical marketplace in this particular period was vibrant, not to say completely overpopulated. So many periodicals disappeared without a trace after a year or two, and many, including other magazines before this one that were called the ladies magazine, but were otherwise quite different, disappeared without a trace after single digit runs. So the very fact that this lasts for so long is really rather remarkable. Part of the magazine's success was its eclectic contents. It was a true miscellany, as I've tried to capture by this particular uh, image of one of my copies of the magazine. I won't attempt to give you um, an exhaustive overview of the magazine's content, because frankly, it would take all of the time I have available today. Suffice it to say, though, that I struggle to think of a single event of note um, that happens in this extraordinary period of domestic and global history that isn't in some way recognised or registered or thought about or debated in the pages of this magazine. And the contents are equally capacious and vast. 
The magazine is full of essays on moral and philosophical themes, as well as educational subjects, particularly um, the subjects of history, of geography, and what I'm representing here with this slide. Uh, this is actually zoology, but it's, I'm sort of using it to capture the magazine's uh, broader interest, really, in what, what they call natural philosophy and we call um, science. Travel writing features prominently in the magazine. This um, image is from its serialised abridgment of uh, Crook's Voyage to the Pacific, which was adapted for the ladies, it said, and which ran in the magazine from 1785 to 1789. Travel writing is very common in the magazine, um, as also are memoirs and biographies of different kinds. Um, not always of women, they're often, they're often of men. In fact, I think there are probably more biographies of men than women in the magazine. But th those of women tend to be celebrating women's achievements on the stage, the page or in court. There is also a lot of poetry in the magazine. It has a dedicated poetry section every month. It, later in its run, it starts to uh, print reviews. It has a news section each month too, domestic and foreign. It's quite amusing actually during the American War of Independence to watch how America kind of migrates between these two sections of the magazine and it, as it tries to work out whether the, these colonies still are British or not. Um, and it also has lots and lots and lots of prose fiction um, in the form of translations, short moral tales and serialised novels. And um, it's probably worth pointing out to those who aren't familiar with the magazine as well that all of this text-based content comes from two sources essentially. So some of it is, uh, you have to choose your verb carefully here because they're all quite loaded. I'll say repurposed, is taken or extracted from already published sources, which is totally accepted and very common at the time. So it's reprintings of usually selections from other works like Cook's Voyages, as I've just said. But a very significant, very significant uh, portion of the magazine was produced by its own readers, its reader contributors. Most of these largely unknown writers, largely unknown today, published pseudonymously within the magazine going by Lucinda or Strephon or AZ or whatever. But because of the periodical's impressive circulation figures, which we think were around 10 to 15,000 copies a month at the publication's height, those now unknown writers were reaching audiences every single month that most writers of their generation could only have dreamed. So to give you a point of comparison, their readerships were even estimating conservatively um, about 20 times larger than writers like Jane Austen were reaching when her first novel, Sense and Sensibility, was published in 1811 in a standard print run of just 750 copies. Now, I'm, I'm majorly preoccupied, as you can perhaps tell, by the, um, by the authors in the magazine and the, the, the text content in the magazine. And in fact, this features very prominently in, a, in a, an academic book I'm writing about, about the publication, which I hope will be coming out next year, pandemics and recessions um, permitting. But when I was working on the PhD, this was not my focus. My focus was very much on a, a very sort of narrow um, stream, if you like, through the magazine which was its fashion coverage. That's what I was most interested in back there. That said, I, the fashion coverage takes many forms and I just want to uh, give you a quick overview of them because I have a bit of a bearing on, 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 on this most recent book. So I was interested in things like this, for instance, the illustrations that accompanied the magazine's uh, short fiction and which if you look at them over the 62 year period, give you a lovely kind of fashion catalog, if you like, um, over the decades. I was really interested in the many essays on fashion that appear in the magazine and things like these fashion reports with their sort of hypnotically staccato um, prose. I was also really interested, and this is probably the thing about the magazine that has most attracted people's attention historically, where people have talked about the ladies magazine before, the majority have talked about things like this, which are its fashion plates. Um, they, become regular features of the magazine in the 1790s and standard in every single issue from 1800 when it upped its price so that it could accommodate them because hand-coloured engravings of course are not cheap to produce. So I was interested in the plates but I was most interested, I was most interested in the 650 or so embroidery patterns published monthly in the magazine between 1770 
1819. They stopped in 1820 when a new um, series of the magazine was launched. These patterns tended to fall into three types. They were for the embellishment of clothing, such as gowns, petticoats and waistcoats, accessories such as veils, shawls, caps, cravats, gloves and pockets, and household objects from pincushions and watch case papers to fire screens and even map samplers. And I was particularly interested in the patterns for several reasons, really. One of them was that like those fiction engravings I showed you a couple of moments ago, the, the patterns promised to give an insight into the month by month evolutions of fashion over an extended period of time. The plates, as I said, came much later and I've always had a bit of an inbuilt suspicion uh, of the plates anyway. They are beautiful objects and they were very useful to my thesis because my thesis was interested in um, the relationship between ideas and discourses around fashion and their material reality. But I was never really convinced, and I remain unconvinced, that the plates were, as they've often been taken to be, accurate reflections of what most people were wearing in the period. Their primarily aspirational rather than mimetic quality has now, I think, definitively been proved by dress historian and curator Hilary Davidson, who published a wonderful book last year called Dress in the Age of Jane Austen. In contrast to the plates, the patterns are preeminently practical. They are designed for use and they have real world application. But despite my keen interest in the patterns and the stories that I thought they might enable me to tell about, well, not just women's dress, but about women's work and about women's lives, um, I couldn't write about them. It was endlessly frustrating to me. I knew what each of these patterns were. I knew what they were designed for because every single pattern is listed in the contents pages, the first page of each issue of the ladies' magazine. So I could see the titles of all of them in the copies of the magazine I was looking. But virtually none of the patterns had survived in the copies of the magazine that I was reading back in 2000, 2001, in university and public libraries up and down the country. And I was traveling up and down the country to do it because at that point the magazine hadn't been digitized um, and no copyright library or public library has a complete run of it, which is not uncommon with periodicals. Now, the, the absence of the patterns won't surprise any of you if you have done any work with historic periodicals, I wouldn't imagine. Uh, these are publications that have very frequently been filleted by their original readers, who removed images and text for scrapbooking or commonplacing, or used sheets to stoke fires or even to scribble shopping lists on, which I've seen before. And, and don't get me started on the less than scrupulous uh, dealers who have gutted issues because they can make more money from selling a periodical in parts or as a set or as a series of individual plates that they've taken from the magazine than as intact issues. And if you want any kind of sense of just how ubiquitous this practice still is, just spend three seconds on eBay and you'll, you'll see what I mean immediately. But having said that, um, the idea of an intact issue of a historic periodical is something of a myth anyway. The formats in which historic periodicals have most often survived to the present are quite different from their original material incarnations. Today, we tend to read these periodicals as bound annual volumes, but this is not how the magazine's first readers encountered them. They would have seen them like this. So the ladies magazine in its original monthly format was a 56 page pamphlet in effect. I've actually got one of mine here as well. I can show you just how sort of thin it is. A 56 page pamphlet published in soft bluey brown covers on which were printed uh, notices for other published works and ads for cosmetic, medicinal and other commercial products. Intact monthly issues like the one you're seeing on your screen at the moment, which is in the Templeman Library Special Collections at the University of Kent, are very rare. I'd been working on and mostly off the magazine for about 10 years when I found this one in the library that's about two minute walk from my office. It had actually been miscatalogued, so when I came across it, I thought it was a complete year of the magazine, and then I opened it up, started gasping, and it's, it's been recatalogued so because it is such a, it is such a rare find. 
Um, I've, I've now also acquired a couple of um, single monthly issues myself and I'm very glad I have because seeing them in that format has taught me things about the magazine and made me understand things about it that I just wouldn't have known if I hadn't seen it in that format. So I'm not going to say anything more about that now, but, I, but um, yeah, they, they, are, they are lovely things when you can find them. But they're very rare. And the monthly issues are so rare because what would normally happen is that at the end of the calendar year, you take your year's worth of monthly issues to a book binder, you know, 13 issues for 1775 or 1810 or whatever, and the book binder would remove the stitching that fastened the pages together, dispose of the wrappers, the, the covers you can see here, and collate the needle pricked pages into the hardcover boarded volumes that you can read in libraries today. And in so doing, the binders were supposed to be guided by documents like this, the directions to the binder, which were published in the last or supplement issue of each year's magazine and which instructed where visual material was to be positioned relative to its accompanying text. But as you'll notice, if you cast your eye down this list um, in the slide, uh, this is a list um, almost exclusively, I think, of um, illustrations for fiction in the magazine. The patterns aren't listed here. And that's for one very simple reason. The patterns were designed to be used and not preserved. And they were used. The letters of the Lancashire governess Ellen Wheaton, for instance, document um, her asking a friend to send her patterns from the ladies magazine that she'd kept with copies of the periodical in a work bag in a chest of drawers because she wanted to make some of them. And there are even surviving material objects that we can trace back to the magazine's patterns, such as this pair of embroidered shoes. During the stitch off project that I ran, which I'll come on to mention in a moment, Dr. Alicia Kerfords of SUNY Brockport University in the US recognised a pattern that I'd posted on social media. You can see the pattern in the top right of the slide there. She recognised this pattern as being the origins of these shoes, which she'd um, been working on in the VA. The VA catalogue, you can see these shoes online in their catalogue um, right now. It, the VA catalogue dates the shoes to 1770 to 1779, but we were able to say pretty emphatically that you know, they're based on this 1775 ladies magazine pattern. And in fact, I found other extant material objects that I can trace back to ladies magazine patterns since. But I have to say that tracing th those kinds of lines of continuity is absolutely um, needle in a haystack kind of work right now, uh, largely because the patterns themselves are such rare survivals, but also because the kind of mapping of the, of the, um, of the designs is, is very difficult to do, although I'm at a very tentative stage of working on some digital technologies that might um, be able to make that a bit easier for me. But the, the real take home here of, of what I've been saying just now, the thing I really want to emphasise is where the patterns have survived, they are accidents of history, right? They were, they were never meant to survive. They were meant to be used and often in ways that wouldn't have survived the usage. Okay, so I wanted to work on the patterns while I was doing the PhD. I couldn't, they don't feature in, in that or the books that emerge from it at all. Um, and after the PhD, I'd, I'd only been able to write about two or 3,000 words, I think, about the ladies' magazine. And I really wanted to do so much more with its 45,000 plus pages of content. But I decided at that point in my career that it was completely impractical. The magazine hadn't been digitised. Uh, as I say, the copies that I'd found had all sorts of stuff missing from them. So I put the magazine to one side and went in a, a, a parallel direction, I suppose, rather than a different one. Um, to pursue some related questions around women's work that the magazine had got me thinking about. But I always felt that the magazine was unfinished business and that I'd come back to it at, at some point. Um, and did do that after I um, very cheekily managed to persuade Adam Matthew to digitise a complete run of the magazine, which they did in 2013. On the back of that, as Alex said, I devised a research project which was subsequently funded by the Leverhulme Trust and which enabled me and two wonderful postdoctoral researchers, Dr. Jenny DiPlacidi and Dr. Conrad Klaas, to conduct the first in-depth study of the magazine's content and its authors. It was important to me, it, it's always important to me, that the research would be outward facing. And so inbuilt into it was a commitment to produce a series of resources, 
in the form of blog posts, podcasts, and most importantly, in the form of an open access metadata rich index to the magazine that I hoped would engage academics and the general public and just open up this archive for other people to work on as much as enabling us to work on it. But what about the patterns? Well, owing to constraints of time, it was a two year project that we were, that we were um, granted by the Leverhulme, as well as logistic problems around training and the simple fact that as I've been saying, so much multimedia content has been uh, gutted from the periodical. The project that I pitched to the Leverhulme Trust was focused, I was gonna say specifically, it was, it was focused exclusively actually on its text-based content and not on this other material. But I was very happily diverted from this very pragmatic focus about a year into the project when I received a phone call completely out of the blue in my office uh, one day from somebody who had been following the project on social media because she owned a copy of the ladies magazine that she bought she said to me in a jumble sale or a pub I, who buys books in pubs anyway she she's clearly had bought several books in pubs but anyway she couldn't remember where she got it from but she had this book and she wanted to pass it on um, she'd been in poor health she said that her children um, were not quite the bibliophiles that she was and that she was worried that they might not look over what she described as this old tatty magazine from 1796. Well, I, I told her not, not to give me the magazine, um, but that I would very happily buy it from her. So I went to visit her um, in her home, and I must confess initial disappointment when she presented me with this copy of the magazine. Um, I do have it here, I think. Yes, I do. So I will show you it. Um, so this is, this is what she brought over to me while I was sat at her kitchen table. And as I say, I was disappointed. The reason I was disappointed is not the quality of the binding because that doesn't worry me at all. But because normally um, volumes of the ladies magazine would be about that thick, twice as thick. So when I saw this, I was like, that's not a year of the, I could see immediately that that wasn't a year of the ladies magazine. And in fact, it's a half year, which is very unusual um, that some periodicals were supposed to be bound in half years, um, like things like La Belle Assemblée and others, but, but the ladies magazine was supposed to be bound in annual volume. So this is weird, there, there aren't many like this. So I was a bit disappointed, but then, I don't know how well this is gonna come out on the camera, but I'm gonna show you. She turned it around and I saw this, and all of a sudden I got very excited. And the reason why I got excited was this. And there's more of it than you can probably see very well on the camera because of the lighting. But basically there's lots of folded paper that I could see when the book was turned around that way. And my heart sort of skipped a beat because um, experience told me that this could mean only one of really two things. So folded material in the magazine is either, it's song plates is one possibility. So the magazine um, did publish song sheets each month. I may as well show you one actually. I don't think I've got one on the slide. So I'll just show you one in the copy of the magazine like that. I've seen plenty of those. They often get banned in. So I thought it could be those, but there were too many. There were, there were too many bits of folded paper for them just to be song sheets. So I suspected um, that there had to be patterns in this magazine. And indeed there were. In fact, every single pattern for each of the issues in this magazine is in this particular volume. Um, and when I expressed delight about this fact in, in seeing them, the owner said, oh yes, you know, I, I was going to take them out because they kind of ruin the, 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 the way the volume kind of sits. And I, was, I thought, oh my God, thank God she didn't do that. So I was absolutely thrilled that they were still there. Anyway, um, before I explain how, uh, what happened next and how this accidental happening upon the patterns led me down the path to uh, the book um, Jane Austen Embroidery that I recently worked on, um, I want to just interrupt the chronology of the story that I'm bringing you to offer a bit of a brief overview of domestic needlework uh, in the time that the magazine was printed, so the later 18th and early 19th century to think just very briefly, because it's a very complex topic actually, but to think briefly about how women experienced this kind of needlework and to give some kind of brief overview about how subsequent generations of scholars have viewed it. That's one of the patterns from my 1796 volume of the magazine that I acquired. And let me just, yes, let's have a look at some women at work as it was referred to at this time. Okay, so needlework is a common denominator of women's experience um, across classes throughout the late 18th and early 19th centuries, throughout the 18th century. 
the 19th century. But just to be clear, when it comes to the kind of domestic decorative or ornamental needlework that I'm talking about here in relation to these particular patterns, I'm almost exclusively, of course, thinking about needlework that was undertaken by the middling swords and the upper classes. Labouring women in the main didn't have the luxuries of time, of course, or access to the kinds of materials they would have needed to engage in this kind of needlework practice. This kind of work required leisure. Young girls learned to embroider at home and at school from a very young age, so lots of girls would have been um, learning first to sew around the age of five or six, but there are examples of, of, of girls recalling learning earlier than that. And some would have been able to stitch their names before they could write them. Didactic conduct books or advice, sort of advice literature by the likes of John Fordyce and the Reverend James Fordyce place domestic embroidery at the heart of their models of ideal femininity. In their prescriptive formulations, practicing needlework distilled virtues of self-regulation and appropriately feminine, for which read leisured industry. And the work that these women were expected to produce was supposed to materialize the feminine virtues of neatness, of duty, since many embroidered objects were gifted to other people and inconspicuous elegance. And I think we can certainly see that in this lovely um, Reynolds por uh, portrait. But of course, many women railed against those prescriptions and the needlework practices um, with which they were associated. Mary Wollstonecraft, author of, of Indication of the Rights of Woman, published in 1782, is probably the most famous voice of her generation to decry embroidery as a repressive technology designed to keep women's hands busy at the expense of their minds. Um, I should say here, because it does slightly um, frustrate me, that I, th I think sometimes Wollstonecraft's views um, are slightly misrepresented when we put them in quite such bold terms. I mean, her argument is, her argument is nuanced. She was particularly concerned in, in A Vindication of the Rights of Woman when she does talk about needlework. She was particularly concerned that the fact that middle-class women, middling sort women, were being encouraged so actively to engage in plain and ornamental sewing at home meant that they were taking the bread out of the mouths of labouring women and their families they could and should be doing this work for them, was Wollstonecraft's view. But, her, but the view is often expressed, you'll find it anywhere you read about needlework in this period, Wollstonecraft's views are often just, um, often represented as straightforwardly anti-needlework. And while she certainly is no fan of it, um, it's a more complex argument than it's often presented to be. Nonetheless, um, this more straightforwardly um, anti-needlework view was unequivocally expressed by some other women of the time. I'm thinking in particular about Mary Lamb, who in an article for the British Ladies Magazine for 1815 wrote, and I'm quoting here, needlework and intellectual improvement are naturally in a state of warfare. And for those of you who are unaware of her story, the talented and fiercely intelligent Mary Lamb was forced to support her family including her famous essayist brother Charles, by becoming a dressmaker, an occupation that she detested and deeply resented and which dramatically affected her already precarious mental health. One day, in fact, Lamb broke down and moved to attack her female apprentice whilst working and accidentally killed her mother who was trying to shield the young girl from harm. For a long time, the voices of Wollstonecraft and Lamb overdetermined scholarly and popular narratives about women and needlework in this period. There have been concerted efforts to dislodge or at least to nuance and problematize those narratives, most notably in Razika Parker's wonderful book, The Subversive Stitch from 1984, and more recently in work I've been doing and the work of Amanda Vickery, Chloe Wigston Smith, Serena Dyer, and most recently Freya Gowerly. Nonetheless, these narratives persist. Um, and they persist, I think, for various reasons. Um, partly, of course, it's because of feminism's vexed relationship to needlework. And also, I think, um, more locally, it's because 18th century scholars, I, I would say, tend to um, accord conduct books 
more cultural weight than they've arguably ever held. So I think we tend to think about needlework as a repressive technology because that's how conduct books represent it. But I think the very fact that there were so many conduct books being produced year in, year out suggests that the kinds of things they were saying were not understood in those ways by the people writing the books. If they were understood in those ways already, you wouldn't need to keep reinforcing the message. Anyway, so my, just to be clear here, my point, my, my point here is not to um, cast doubt on Wollstonecraft's or Lamb's views or to say that they're not more representative than, than simply representing the views of those individual women. Like, clearly their views were more broadly shared. There were other women for whom needlework was um, a similarly rep repressive practice. But my, my point here, and I think it, it, it really does warrant repeating, is that their views were not universally representative at all. And it's this capturing of the spectrum of women's experience of needlework within and across classes that um, I'm really interested in. And it's, it's, it's a research project that I'm sort of developing um, after the ladies magazine book is, is finished. It's a, the act of capturing that spectrum of women's experience feels to me to be very important, not simply or even primarily for what it might tell us about the history of needlework, though that is intrinsically interesting, I guess, but for the access that such histories might help, uh, might provide us to women's histories otherwise lost because of the scholarly tendency to privilege certain source materials, particularly uh, literary texts or any written documents above others like crafts, which were practiced by women, of course, of variable literacies and who in many cases left no other archival trace for us to follow. So it seems to me anyone who's really seriously committed to the project of understanding women's history should be looking in these places to non-textual sources. I'm not the only person, of course, who says this. Plenty of people who work in material culture studies say this, but needlework seems to be a particular blind spot um, for, for, for many people when it, when, it, when it comes to these kind of efforts. One famous and highly literate woman who did leave more of an archival trace than most in relation to their attitudes towards needlework is Jane Austen. And it's a slightly, it's slightly, it feels slightly odd for me to say that because you don't, um, Jane Austen very famously left little by way of archival trace relative to many of her contemporary uh, writers. Most of her correspondence was destroyed by her sister and she didn't leave much stuff for us really. Nonetheless, there is a lot in the material, in the archive that does exist to uh, give us some sense of her attitudes towards needlework, which for Jane Austen was not the solitary and decorous activity imagined in the conduct books, but a bit more like that Reynolds um, slide, but in a less idealised form, was a sociable and communal activity. Indeed, in Austen's accounts, it's usually somewhat raucous as well. My favourite Jane Austen anecdote, as I'm apt to tell anyone who'll listen to me rant on about this, is one that's uh, re related by one of her nieces, Marianne Knight, who recalls silently working at her needle with her aunt by, by the fireside at Godmersham Park in Kent, only to be disrupted by the novelist bursting into laughter, running to a table, frantically scribbling something for one of her novels before returning and, quote, quietly working as before. Jane Austen, like other Georgian women, such as Mary Delaney, who I discuss um, at various points in Jane Austen embroidery, saw intellectual labour, or what Jane Austen referred to as the labours of the novelist, and new work as compatible and mutually enriching activities. There's plenty of other evidence from Jane Austen's biography and, as I say, in the material archive to indicate that she was a talented stitcher as well as being a talented novelist. And further evidence to suggest that she took pride in both forms of work. Her nephew, James Edward Austen Lee, famously wrote in his 1870 memoir that his aunt would have put a sewing machine to shame and we can perhaps see why. So um, this is a, an image that will be familiar to any of you who've been to Jane Austen's House Museum in Chawton in Hampshire. This is a quilt that she co-created, um, which is on display there. She also made a needle case for a friend, uh, Mary Lloyd, and, and both of these objects clearly demonstrate um, Austen's technical competences, competency, excuse me, with a needle, although we cannot use them to corroborate her nephew's claims about Jane Austen's excellent satin stitch. But a monographed 
a monogrammed handkerchief created by Jane Austen for her sister Cassandra does rather prove her nephew's point. And if this gorgeous white work Indian muslin shawl, also held by Jane Austen's Haas Museum, is in fact the author's work. We're not entirely sure of its provenance, but um, many members of the family believe and other experts are inclined to believe that it is her work, then I think we can consider the case closed. She was excellent at the satin stitch. This is a really gorgeous piece of white work and th those crosses are really exquisitely, um, really exquisitely executed. Austin's surviving correspondence evidence her keen interest in fabrics, in fashion and style, um, albeit an interest that was constrained by the very limited budget that she had to live off as an unmarried woman who was living on the fringes of gentility and the goodwill of her male relatives. We also find numerous references in her letters to what we might term now Regency upcycling, um, as she immerses herself in what she referred to as the mischief of fashioning uh, new trimmings for caps and bonnets, many of which she made herself. Jane Austen used her needle in the service of her sense of style. She was flattered when her friends Martha Lloyd and Mrs Lefroy asked for the pattern for some caps that she and her sister Cassandra had recently made, but she was not at all pleased with Cassandra after she gave them the pattern, presumably because it meant that these women could emulate emulate that style for themselves. This was, this was not, not what she wanted. Now, we don't know. I have no idea where Jane Austen got that pattern for those caps that she mentions in the letter from. It could have been from a local haberdasher. I mean, who knows? She could have even designed it herself. You often um, find letters between women in the period which have sort of got doodles around the side which look like embroidery patterns or specifically for designs for needlework. But I just want to um, suggest to you that another possible, maybe even probable source, might be the ladies magazine that period periodical i was talking to you about before and a periodical that we know jane austen read um and just put in this for fun i talk about this in jane austen embroidery in some detail it's an image from the april 1800 edition, uh, issue of the magazine this um mrs lee perrett was jane austen's aunt um, and this image was commissioned by the magazine to accompany its account of Mrs. Lee Perrott's trial at the Taunton Assizes for stealing a card of lace from the haberdasher Elizabeth Gregory. Um, Mrs. Lee Perrott was acquitted in about 15 minutes and the ladies magazine is just horrified that she was ever incarcerated as she was for a period of several, three months, I think. Um, with her husband while she was awaiting trial. Um, but yes, I, 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 I do. Uh, wonder what the Austen family thought about this coverage, sympathetic though it is, in the ladies' magazine. This is April 1800, but we have plenty of uh, anecdotal evidence that Jane Austen was engaging with and reading the ladies' magazine before this date. I won't give you a kind of forensic um, analysis of, of the evidence that's available. Um, I'll just give you a couple of examples so you know that this isn't purely a flight of fancy. Um, she was most definitely looking at the magazine by 1794, or at least at some point referring back to it, when the ladies' magazine published a short story called The Shipwreck in its supplement issue for that year. This 1794 tale is about a Miss Brandon, a woman possessed of, and I'm quoting here, good sense and sensibility, where have we heard that before, but persuaded by her father out of an attachment to a Mr. Willoughby, who as you'll know if you've read that novel is the, the rakish um, hero who Marianne is enchanted by in that novel. And if that isn't enough to convince you um, then exhibit B would come in the form of the 1802 short story Guilt Perceived by Conscience, another tale in the ladies magazine, this, this time one that features a, a character called Mr. Knightley, a country gentleman, who marries an obscure orphan from a rural boarding school, just like Harriet Smith, uh, who at the start of the tale is terrified after being accosted in the woods by a vagrant. It's tantalizing to me to think that Austin may have used embroidery patterns from the magazine as creatively as she used plots um, like these from these and other of its short fiction in her novels. Okay, back to the main narrative. So I said earlier that um, surviving patterns from the ladies' magazine are accidents of history, and it was a less than fortuitous accident that inadvertently put me on the next steps of my research journey 
towards Jane Austen embroidery. So 24 hours after buying that 1796 half volume of the magazine, with the lovely patterns in it, uh, I was hit by a car driving home from work one day and I uh, sustained a back injury. It was fairly minor, but it was significant enough that I couldn't sit at my desk really for prolonged periods of time. Uh, working was very difficult and I was deeply bored and in a bit of discomfort. So I channeled all of that like academics want to do onto Twitter. Um, where I posted photographs of my new prize possession and particularly uh, headline items. So this is a, for a gentleman's cravat, which is uh, from that 1796 issue, which I have made, although, yeah, I'm not going to show you what that looks like. Anyway, I was, t I was totally, totally unprepared uh, for the response that I got from sharing images like this one. It started with lots of questions uh, about you know, what, what these were, where were the patterns from, how they might have been used, and very quickly turned into a sort of tidal wave of questions from people saying, I, I, how could I make this myself? I want, to, I want to make this. Tantalized by the prospect of the patterns coming back to life and eager to know what I might learn from people making them, I launched what I referred to um, I slightly regret this now, but um, what I referred to at the time as the Great Ladies Magazine Stitch Off, and um, which gives you pretty um, accurate insights into what I was what I was watching on the TV at the time. So I put I put six those six patterns from the 1796 issue on a website so that people could look at them and, and make them if they so wished and, and share their experiences on social media. And within a few weeks, I was able to add some more patterns. So um, I. I've been looking for a very long time for the 1819 uh, volume of the magazine. It had been, we weren't able to put it on the Adam Matthew digitization that I mentioned earlier, which was published in 2013, because we couldn't find one. I think, I think there's one in Wales, but it's in a very, very poor state. So I couldn't get to look at it. We couldn't, certainly couldn't um, reproduce it. Um, and after years of looking, I managed to find that a Swiss bookseller was sending one and used some very, very dodgy A-level German to try and buy it. Anyway, when that arrived in the post happily one day, lo and behold, it had two patterns in it. So they, they were delightful. And the patterns are very different when you, by the time you get to 1819, much more um, precise, geometric and carefully drawn. And they were a delight to look at. So I added those to the website. Um, and then within a few days of that, um, I was alerted to the existence of some more. Never, never underestimate the power of serendipity in research. Um, I one day I was sat working at my desk and I had classical music on in the background as I quite often do. Um, I was listening to Radio 3 and lo and behold into my, <laughs> into my email inbox pinged, pinged an email from the presenter of the programme that I was actually listening to at the time on Radio 3, uh, Penny Gore. Uh, it, I was listening to a pre-recorded lunchtime concert and Penny emailed me to say I've just I've seen all this stuff on social media and by the way I've got a copy of the ladies magazine from 1775 and it's got it's got three patterns in it would you like to see them and I was just absolutely thrilled the three patterns that she had were for a, a waistcoat uh, one of the patterns had two shoe designs on it so that shoe uh, embroidered shoe upper that I showed you earlier that's from Penny's um, magazine and oh here it is I've got an enlargement of it um, and also there was a, a glorious um, muff um, pattern as well he kindly said you know we could use and put on the website too so by this point then we had 11 patterns and within weeks and months we had dozens dozens of embroiderers uh professional uh amateur first time indeed embroiderers as well as textile artists from the uk from europe the us and australia who were working on modern recreations of the patterns and sharing their experiences on blogs twitter and facebook in 2016, I was invited to curate the objects in a dedicated room of their own at a major exhibition to commemorate the 200th anniversary of the publication of Jane Austen's Emma at Chawton House. And the table in the middle of that slide is the centerpiece of that exhibition, but we had stuff all around it. And I've just, I, I can't, I'm really sorry that I can't show them all to you because they're all beautiful objects, but I've just um, handpicked a few here and I'll show you some more in a moment. The stitch off was, and I suspect will remain, the most enjoyable thing I've ever done in my career. People of all ages from 80 to 80 something and from very different needlework backgrounds, from complete beginners to embroidery, embroiderers guild members and teachers to Royal School of Needlework graduates took part. 
We conversed with each other as a community on social media, real life friendships were made, and in the exhibition, as in the ladies' magazine itself, the work the professionals and amateurs sat side by side. Now, I deliberately set no rules for the stitch off. Some people asked me to give them rules, and I just I didn't know why they wanted to do that. I wanted to keep it as open as possible to see what people might do with the patterns and gave them as little context at the time as I, as I could, felt I could get away with. Um, and as I said, I don't have time to talk you through even a fraction of the lovely exhibits that people made, but I'm just going to show you a few examples. So some people um, use the patterns, uh, replicated them using historically authentic methods and in line with the original expectations of the pattern drawers. So here you have a absolutely stunning, stunning pair of shoes um, with hand beaten buckles and hand turned wooden soles that was made by Nicole Rudolph in a workshop in Colonial Williamsburg, which she kindly shipped to us to exhibit at Chawton. So that's that shoe pattern, the one that's in the V&A. And it's remarkable, Nicole didn't know about the V&A pair, I think. She's, she's done it the other way round, the design, the, the shoes in the V&A, but the colours are extraordinarily similar. It looks very similar. Um, this is the same pattern, worked up very differently by Maggie G into a beautiful kissing ball. So we had some people who used historically authentic techniques, but modernised the objects that, they, that the designs were being used for. This is another example of that latter kind, where someone's taken the pattern and, and modernised it. This is one of my favourite exhibits um, from the Stitch Off. This was by Patrice Chasteau, who flexed a 1796 gown pattern design into an embroidered portrait of the Creole Miss Lamb, a character from Jane Austen's Unfinished Sanditon, which is um, which she presented on a massive, I think this was about 24 inches, um, hoop. Patrice's design, as I say, is one of many examples where stitch-off patterns eschewed hand embroidery for modern machine-stitched interpretations. Um, here I've given you a couple more examples. So on the left we have a, a, a waistcoat pattern that would have been sort of vertically down the, the fronts of the waistcoat and would have been sort of horizontally along the base. But 1775 waistcoat pattern, which Caroline has um, machine embroidered over a, a map of Jane Austen's Hampshire. And then we had lots of mixed media um, imaginings as well. So on the right, textile artist Corinne Young has produced this beautiful sort of stitched flower pot, again using that, um, again using a pattern in a very way. So this is, this is a segment of a much larger muff pattern that she's adopted for the, for, the, for the flower pot itself. And here we have a crocheted reticule using the same waistcoat pattern that Caroline had used vertically down that map. Um, this is a, a crocheted reticule um, used, uh, created by the crochet designer Rachel Whitechurch. How much time do I have? Okay, I'll wrap up. So packing up the objects to return to their makers after the exhibition was a, was a very sad day for me, but um, I, I uh, still kept in touch with various people who participated in the stitch off and people were still making the objects. In fact, they're still making them and I get, I get, um, I get lots of emails about it all the time. One of the people who kept in touch was Alison Larkin, who created this um, piece based on a 176 shawl pattern from the volume I acquired. Bring, uh, Captain Cook's the Captain Cook Memorial Museum in me, where she's done a lot of work over the years and where she was. Um, as part of a sailor's wives exhibition, Cook's wife uh, was, a, was a talented embroiderer. I think we may have temporarily lost Jenny, so if everybody can just bear with us a moment and um, hopefully Jenny can reconnect. Can you see me? Yes, you're back now, Jenny. Thank you. That's lovely. <laughs> Um, so what I've had to do is I've had to do this on my phone and just turn the internet off. I don't know what's happened. So, but I don't really have many more. I didn't really have many more slides to show you. Um, so I can just do this on my phone. I'm doing this on 4G. That's um, absolutely okay. fine. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. Um, so I think what I showed you just before the video stopped because I was showing you a lovely um, image that uh, of, of a piece that Alison Larkin had made using a, sh a, sh a shawl pattern that I'd released for the for the project. Um, and in fact, Alison is an Embroiderers Guild member. And after I packed up the exhibition at Chawton and sent things back to people, uh, Alison 
got back in touch with me and said, oh, would you do a talk about it for the Embroiderers Guild, Yorkshire and Humber branch, which I did. And I was giving a talk um, about needlework in Jane Austen's Britain. And what happened at the end of this was that um, I was really struck by a comment from an audience member who was a very experienced embroiderer and who looked at one of the pattern pictures of the images that I've shown you in, in, in this talk today and said to me, I couldn't do that. And I sort of looked at her quizzically, wondering why, given her degree of competency. And she said, well, looking at that picture would for me be like um, looking at a photograph of a completed recipe in a recipe book and not having the ingredients list or the method. And that thought started whir whirling around in my head and really niggling at me because I thought, well, you know, I, I sew, I've sewn on and off my for my whole life. I'm not very good, but I'm enthusiastic. Um, and I thought, well, you know, all the work I've done, all the research I've done means I know what to do with this pattern. What, sh what, this, what this audience member, of course, was daunted by, which I haven't yet told you about the patterns, but is crucial to remember, is that they were never printed with written instructions. So the um the patterns were just printed in the format that i've shown you today alongside you know travel writing or all sorts of other material in the magazine unlike victorian magazines which gave information on stitches and fabrics and colors and sometimes very detailed and prescriptive step by steps that doesn't exist in the ladies magazine which gave makers an extraordinary degree of create creative um flexibility in working up the designs. That's, that's why even very experienced embroiderers like this audience member were very perplexed and daunted by the prospect of making the patterns in these particular kinds of ways. And I thought, well, that's interesting because as I say, I, I know what to do with them without instruction, but no one is gonna wanna copy anything I try and make. So I was, I was sort of um, ruminating on this in Coffee with Alison. And of course, Alison is an incredibly talented embroiderer. She's a professional embroiderer. She teaches embroidery in workshops and, and, and so forth. And she's done research on Georgian embroidery, particularly the embroidery of Elizabeth Cook, Captain Cook's wife. Um, and we were talking about this particular question and questions afterwards. And that is the seed for the book that became Jane Austen Embroidery, which we conceived of with a mission to open up the patterns to more people who might be interested in them. So combining my research on the patterns to contextualize them for people, and then for Alison to write detailed step by steps. And what we've done in the book, which I can't uh, show you on my slides now, but I do have a copy of it here. So I can perhaps just give you a brief glimpse into it. The book has a series of essays in it, lovely illustrated essays with lots of photographs as well of, it, of surviving objects uh, uh, along the lines of some of the things I've been talking about today. It's followed, the, the introduction is followed by um, a materials and methods section which talks about how this would have been done at the time and how to go about recreating these patterns now and has very clear stitch diagrams. So you can start with this book as a complete beginner and you can work up the, the, the stitches. There's a fairly limited range used in the book as is, was, would have been the case at the time. Um, so you can work on the stitches and practice them. And then we have 15 projects based on 15 pa patterns of those three types that I mentioned earlier. So patterns for embroidered clothes, patterns for embroidered objects, and patterns for embroidered accessories, each of which has its own introductory section, which I talk about Jane Austen's novels and lots of other novels and uh, surviving uh, objects and things. Um, and putting it together has been an absolute joy, I, would, I, sh I should say, really, um, from start to finish. Just to conclude, I suppose I'll, I'll just say that um, I recently gave a talk about the book at a literary festival, and um, I was asked a question at the end of it, which might um, help to sort of round things off or even open things up at the end here today. The question was from a Jane Austen uh, scholar who wanted to know whether I thought that recreating the patterns in the way we do in the book um, might offer insights into Jane Austen's novels. And I talked around her question for a bit before saying what I probably should have said straight away, which was no. <laughs> um, I don't think this particular form of practice-based research offers any particularly helpful insights into Jane Austen's novels specifically, perhaps because needlework, as I say, was such an indelible part of the fabric of um, women's lives in this period. It actually doesn't get mentioned all that frequently in Austen's novels. Um, although, the, you know, dropping hoops happens or people pretending to be at work when they're really thinking about something else, of course, does, does happen in, in, in her fiction. But what I do think engaging in this research has done has given me a new insight and appreciation into the way that needlework could offer some women 
a, an outlet for creativity that for women like Austin, as I say, was utterly compatible with um, more creative and intellectual pursuits. Precisely because of the lack of instruction with the patterns in the ladies magazine, no two designs worked up from the patterns would have looked the same. And the decisions makers would have had to have made required a high degree of what Chloe Wigston Smith and Serena Dyer have recently described as material literacy, a material literacy which is lost on many of us today. And I suppose it's situating that material literacy in relation, not a hierarchical relation I hasten to add, but in relation to other forms of literacy in the period that is very much the focus of my research now and I think will be in the next few months and years. So I hope you've been able to hear all of that and I hope the technical glitch wasn't too bad, but I think I'll draw a line under it there. Jenny, thank you so much. And um, that was a thoroughly inspirational, and wonderful um, presentation. Thank you also for, for um, bearing so patiently and calmly with the technical glitch as well, <laughs> which is a reminder of the challenges we face in this um, Zoom environment. Um, um, I was struck by so many of the um, things that we've covered and I can't pretend to have any um, knowledge of embroidery myself but um, I wish we were having one of our more typical um, material witness workshops where we, at this point we would be all now turning to a table and, and doing some of this ourselves. Yeah. Um, but sadly we can't do that. Um, but Jenny's very kindly offered to um, answer questions. So. Um, uh, what I would say, if people would like to, um, uh, if you have a question, if you'd like to um, show, reveal yourself um, and maybe put your hand up or you could use the chat function um, and um, I will do my best to um, find you and, and put the question to Jenny. Um, in, in the meantime, before perhaps or while people are formulating questions, Jenny, I just wondered, um, um, really interested by what you were saying about this notion of material literacy and I wondered um, if you have much information about the readership of the magazine itself um, and whether that equated to as what you were saying the sort of the type of um, middling or upper classes that would actually have the, the time um, to be able to do these um, you know do, make, do the embroidery and do the patterns themselves. Yeah so I mean that's, that's a great question thank you it's quite hard to establish the, the, the readership for this. There are no subscription lists, unfortunately for the magazine, um, in a kind of co co in a sort of unified or coherent kind of way. Part of the problem is that the publishers of the magazine, which was uh, the, the family called the Robinson family, George Robinson and then his son and his grandsons, um, they had a, they suffered a series of bankruptcies. They had a massive warehouse fire, and most of their in fact almost all of their archives have been lost. So we don't have their archives. Um, there has been some work done uh, been done by uh, uh, Jan Fergus, book historian, on um, some Midlands archives of books uh, of booksellers, regional booksellers, in the 18th century, which just so happens to reveal all sorts of things about the ladies' magazine, where it suggests that many of the subscribers actually were men, but they were getting it for their wives and sisters and daughters, presumably. And it was also um, also lots of evidence of it being subscribed to by, and we know this from the magazine itself, actually, was being subscribed to by schools. So boarding schools, and not just not just girls' schools, but actually boys' schools were also um, reading the magazine. The best I, I maintain this is the argument I try and pursue in the other book I'm, I'm I'm writing. But the best evidence I think we have for the magazine's readership is who wrote for it, because as I say, so much of the content was produced by readers. And if that, if from what I can gather from the readers I've been the writers I've been able to identify and that my colleagues did on the project we were working on, that absolutely does, it's firmly middle class, like firmly middle class. There are some upper class readers, but very much middle class. The magazine was cheap, it was cheap. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, it was, it was sixpence an issue for the first, its first three decades. Ma there were magazines being published in the 1730s that were sixpence an issue. So it was relative to other forms of print, it was very, it was very affordable and it tried to keep its price low for as long as possible. So its readership was sort of, it, it said it was from shop girls to duchesses, but, uh, but actually I think the, the, the evidence points to the fact that most of it was sort of lower middling and middling sort. Oh, thank you. And it's interesting because I was struck by some of the patterns that you showed, which were for cravats or waistcoats. So, you know, it, I mean, I was wondering whether any, you know, there's any information about any men that might have done any of this um, embroidery and needlework themselves. Well, not not actually in the in, internally within the magazine, but a lot of professional embroiderers were men um, in in this period, and increasingly it becomes um, something that more and more women are you know become known for. But a lot of professional embroidery was undertaken by men in this period. 
domestic embroidery I have much there's much less evidence as to who precisely is taking who's undertaking it and in what conditions but I would imagine there are some men I'd love to find them anyway <laughs> We're, um, we've come to the end of our um, time that we allocated for, for your um, workshop. And um, I think I can probably speak for, for all of us to say um, thank you so much for providing a fabulous, um, fabulous presentation and, and um, so many um, ideas and food for thought for us all. And perhaps we can um, look forward to a time when we can invite you back in person and we can uh, resume um, the part of the workshop we're missing whereby we all get to have a go. Um, that would be I a would wonderful to look forward to if you'd be interested. I would love that. Yeah, I'd love that. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much um, uh, from, from all of us. And um, in terms of material witness, um, we um, hope to be back. Um, Alex will be running her weeds um, sketching um, webinar in uh, next month, and we hope to program some more um, material um, over the next few months. So um, watch the space and um, we'll keep in touch. So many thanks and enjoy the long weekend.